live from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering Smartsheet Engage 2019. Brought to you by Smartsheet. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of Smartsheet Engage here in Seattle, Washington. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Jeff Frick. We have Chris Marsh on the program. He is a Research Director of Workforce Productivity and Compliance at 451 Research. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So you have just completed a massive report yep. that really looks at the future of work. And, and the premise is that the future of work is changing dramatically because of the rise of digital technologies. It's, it's changing the way companies think about employees, the way employees think about their jobs. Give, give us sort of the high level findings here. Yeah, so yeah, a big report took me most of my summer, so I kind of hibernated for a good month and a half to do it. Um, and yeah, it crystallizes a lot of our views around how you know, protest technology and culture are coming together to, to ground new ways of working. Um, and I guess the basic premise is that uh, we all know this pervasive friction across day-to-day -day work. I mean, we've sort of dysfunctionally accepted that as a status quo, but actually we see in a lot of our survey research that it's being regarded increasingly in the upper echelons of, of management within companies as a priority that needs to be, that needs to be addressed. In fact, we had some survey work um, that came out of field recently. It was to both IT and line of business decision makers, and it was what should IT's priority be when it comes to transformation initiatives. And number one was improving the productivity and collaboration experience. Now, if you put that in the context of all the other things on IT's plate, the fact that that's number one, when traditionally it hasn't been, is, is significant. And actually, we did the same question, same survey, September last year, and it was number one then. And that was the first time it blipped on the radar. So this is, you know, risen up the agenda, exec management, IT leadership, um, are now looking at ways to address that pervasive friction. So I guess the basic premise of, of our thinking is that a lot of the legacy technologies aren't, I mean they've led to that friction in some ways, right? So most companies have organized in one way or another around the silos that applica traditional applications have created and that's created organizational silos and, and hence all of the friction. But we see a lot of interesting new technology trends and tooling that are allowing people to basically operationalize work in the seams between those legacy systems. So lifting some of the data information and potentially workflow, workload out of those systems and having them in a, you know, some of the new types of work platform that we're seeing, you know, of which Smartsheet's a good example, to actually operate in a much more agile way. And we call that shift one from systems of record, which we kind of understand, to what we call systems of delivery. Um, so that, to us, will have a big gravitational effect on the way the rest of the business application landscape will evolve. So didn't the IT uh, kind of grow up to support the silos that were defined before there was IT? There was always sales, there was marketing, there yeah. was the executive suite, there was accounting. Um, and, and the IT and the apps grew to be aligned. So do you yeah. think now that the actual collaboration apps like Smartsheet can actually pull can pull the, the silos of the organization into this more hybrid structure? Yeah, I think, I think that it certainly looks like, I think that's what companies want to happen. Um, I think it's still early days. I mean, the way, the way most companies are set up, you know, actually has a lineage going back a couple of hundred years, the industrial revolution and mechanization leading to standardization, leading to compartmentalization, and then you have lines of business as we kind of currently understand it. And that's why this is such an interesting time at the moment, because a lot of that is breaking down relatively quickly. Um, and obviously the computing area has been the, the prime catalyst for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, other things that come out of our survey research, a, a massive appetite from senior managers for more collaboration across departments, right? So not just within teams, which in and of itself is a challenge, but across departments. Um, so, you know, marketing speaking more often and more purposefully with finance, legal speaking more often with operations. So there is an appetite for higher order types of not just collaboration, but actually work design, planning, work execution, um, not just sitting in those departmental silos. And so, what do you think yeah. is driving this, ap this appetite? Because I mean, it would seem like it was always there and maybe that there's just a recognition that we have the tools and yeah. the technology to actually execute. Or yeah. is there something that's actually fundamentally changing about the global world that we're living in? Yeah, I mean, so we talk about in the report about this era of personalization, right? Which is just everything we've seen explode in the consumer domain around technology and the 
acclimatization, we've all had to new kinds of digital experience and how they are coming into the workforce. People want new, people will have expectations for new kinds of digital experience as part of their day-to-day -day work. Um, and so that's one thing. The obviously the related element to that is that companies need to be much more agile in responding to disruptions in their own market. And this is obviously vertical agnostic now. So if there's one thing that you really need to make sure you're good at in the digital age, it's being agile, right? Spotting the sort of signals in the market, understanding what they mean in terms of customer demand, and then you know, catering to that demand quickly with some kind of new product or service or, or experience. So I think it's that need to be able to respond really quickly because there's so much disruption that technology has brought to us that means that companies are saying, okay, we can't any longer wait six months for this, this project life cycle or this work life cycle to, to, to run its course. We need to respond more quickly, we need to organize much more agile. We all need to be on the same page when it comes to what we're supposed to be doing, right? So there's a, a, a big demand for a clear line of sight across work. Um, so I think that's, that's probably where it's coming from. All companies realizing we need to act quicker, respond quicker. I'm curious, you know, it took a long time for DevOps to really be accepted as the optimal way to create products, right? Versus a, a PRD and an, an MRD and then a PRD and then we define it and we take these and we build it and shoot, we miss the market, right? It, yeah. it changed. In terms of actually running the business though, I mean, do you have any kind of point of view on how long it will take for people to figure out that yes, we can make micro adjustments on our strategy based on speed, competitive threats, but at the same time, I've got to be executing on some of these longer term mm. objectives as well, which I would yeah. imagine would be a pushback sure. um, yeah. on, that, on that technique. Yeah, I mean, it, it will take as long as the technologies need to have to emerge to support companies really operating in that kind of agile way. Um, I mean, one of the things we talk about um, is the, what we call the three A's, right? So the imperative to be agile operationally. I think there's growing realization that that means that there needs to be tooling to support more autonomy, which is the second A, right? More autonomy for more of the workforce to do higher order types of thing. So rather than having these centralized teams of process specialists or you know, technical experts, there needs to be more capability in the tooling, the everyday tooling for, for people to design, work, and execute on it. But that really is dangerous if you, know, if you don't have the alignment piece, which goes back to kind of what you were saying about, we can't just have a distributed set of teams who are going off and doing their own thing. There needs to be alignment back to strategy. There needs to be alignment potentially back to governance and compliance. And there needs to be alignment potentially also to work that's adjacent but relevant that's happening in other teams, maybe in other departments. So I think that's really the sweet spot, how you balance those three things. Um, which is driving a lot of the new interesting technologies that we're seeing emerge. But you know, we're still in relatively early days, I think. Um, so you know, give it some time to, to play out. There's different layers of abstraction, I think, in software that, that needs to happen for organizations to really be able to operate in that agile way. There's resource management, there's planning, there's process automation. A lot of these things have been resident, really, in discrete kinds of tooling, but they're broadly being democratized and Smartsheet's actually a good example of the type of company that's beginning to offer those kinds of capabilities workforce-wide to Smartsheet users, whereas they were maybe, maybe previously just a preserve of certain types of specialist user. I want to ask about what, you, what this means for the individual employee in terms of, it sounds as though he or she will be more empowered to do more yeah. and execute, uh, but also expected, more, well, more will be expected of that employee in terms of what his or her skill levels are. And then I also want to ask what you're seeing here at Smartsheet Engage that is most interesting to you, particularly as it relates to the report. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I guess it's inevitable that more will be expected of employees, but I think, you know, in a, in a broad sense, what we're seeing is the balance of power shift, um, not in absolute terms, but in, in you know, relative to how, how it's looked historically towards the employee. So a definite strand of inquiry amongst our clients in 451 has been, how do we create an employee engagement narrative, right? There's growing realization that we've talked about customer experience for a long time, but we've, we've, we've neglected the idea of an employee experience. Um, so more companies are realizing that happy employees tend to be the more productive ones. Mm -hmm. So how do we introduce the right combination of tooling, technologies, and then compensation, and then career opportunities to allow people to feel more engaged and empowered so that they can do those higher order kind of things. Um, and this, you know, this, is, this is happening in a very kind of organic way. So 
Um, you know, I, I, I don't see this as companies saying, you know, you need to now achieve more. It's a little bit more, we need to provide you with the ability to achieve more. That's really the role of anybody who's making a decision around technology in an enterprise at the moment. But it's interesting because the, the company has so much more data than they had before yeah. on, on kind of execution and some of the demos in the, in the keynote in terms of what are utilization and how many hours are you applying to this task. So it almost feels like there's more of a, you know, treating people like a resource versus treating people like people. And I'm just curious how that you know, kind of plays, because you, you mm. want to do that, you want to measure, you yeah. want to know how your resources are allocated but at the same time, they're, they're people, they're not machines, yeah. and, and they're motivated as people, and that's yeah. how you keep them or lose them, a lot of times is the people part, not necessarily yeah. the job or the task. Yeah. So how does, how does that yeah. map in? If I'm aggressive and I'm feeling good, yeah, I like doing more, but there's probably a lot of people that you know, aren't necessarily <laughs> up for that job. Yeah, there's been, I mean, there's been a lot of um, talk in this conference already, um, but more broadly in, in other fora of, um, the implications of more data in the context of machine learning and artificial intelligence, the degree to which, you know, by automating things that may previously have been done manually, is that going to upset people? I think on the whole, um, you know, for a lot of types of work that maybe Smartsheet is enabling, that's not so much of a concern. Because you'll see here from their users, very engaged, very enthusiastic, they want to get as much value and leverage out of the platform as possible because they realize that's allowing them to do things that previously they hadn't. But there is that sort of dichotomy of, um, at what point do we automate things and not give you a choice in the fact that that's been automated. But I think these guys and, and other, the industry broadly is, is very conscious of that. So where you see all the kind of data being leveraged to do intelligent recommendations, intelligent notifications, there's going to be a, a, a wary eye on doing that without either an opt-in or where an opt-in maybe isn't required, at least having permission from the end user um, to accept the implications of whatever's being recommended to do. So I think on the whole, you know, people are sort of trying to figure out what that balance is. What do you think this means for the war, on, war for talent? Because I mean, this is the, this is the topic that, that the technology industry in particular is really grappling with, particularly when there's so many uh, high level skills that are needed skills in uh, AI and ML mm. and other kinds of specialized technology. How do you how do you put your your findings in that context? Yeah, I mean, it's it really came on the agenda this theme a um, couple of years ago, if not a little bit sooner than that, as as a really strategic issue. And in fact, we see that in our own survey research. We we asked the question to um, employees across the workforce, man, non-managerial to C-suite, and it was you know strategically one what one thing do you need to improve on, and it was. Um, uh, it was basically recruiting, developing, and managing talent. And that's ahead of you know, everything else, like improving our um, product differentiation, improving our customer experience, um, coming up with a, a, a strategy that's more fit for purpose, right? It was all about talent and people and managing people. So it's definitely risen up the agenda. I mean, I think one of the things that companies definitely are beginning to think about is how to um, increase the acquisition of skills in the existing workforce in a way that's quicker than the way that's being done now. So actually one of the other areas we cover in our research is this shift from like traditional learning management systems which have been kind of compliance oriented. You need to do this course or training because we need to show that you've done it. To the kind of new generation of LXPs or learning experience platforms which provide much more agile ways for people to understand skills gaps and, and, and take on those skills. So I think that's going to be a big driver actually of of the agile ways of working that we're talking about, but also how people address talent, the talent wars. If you can't find it externally, or you can't find enough externally, um, you can look internally, of course, to existing employees and make sure that they have the, the platform to, to acquire new skills. And so it's almost a, by rule you can't find it externally, because right now just the, the, there's just not that much labor out there to go get, it's just so yeah. competitive. So you've got to develop a lot of that in, inside. Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, and it's not just sort of technical skills, it's other kinds of skills, right? Um, but I think, there's a, I think there's a nascent appetite amongst a lot of the workforce just to do that from a career progression point of view, right? right? If, you know, and I think that's one of the implications of companies trying to find ways to be more operationally agile, manage resources in more kind of agile ways. You know, it might be the case that people who maybe wouldn't be considered for a particular role um, might now be considered because they, they you know, saw that there was a capacity problem, a resource problem, they learned the skill, they can be assigned to that kind of project. 
Whereas previously, maybe lines of department, lines of uh, business prevented that visibility into who has skills across the workforce. Right. But it's, it's interesting, you have a point of view about kind of workforce transformation, and you're giving a talk tomorrow, how to avoid the Frankenstein workforce experience, tips yeah. for effective workplace <laughs> transformation. But it's an interesting play that you digitally transform your people to digitally transform your business. People talk about doing it to the business, but they don't talk about doing yeah. it to the people. They talk about the workflows and yeah, the customer I mean, engagement. This, yeah. You're taking it down, you know, start at the base, start at the bedrock. Well, th this is, I mean, this is a, a, a lot of the reason as to why companies like Smartsheet came about. I mean, digital transformation, I think, is a kind of narrative has done a good job of, of making companies realize they need to change and they need to change quickly. Technology's a big enabler of that, but it has tended to be a kind of top-down way of thinking about it. It's tended to be sort of, do you have like a center of excellence? Do you have a technology council? How do we sort of transform from core outwards? It's not really been grassroots from the bottom up, but increasingly tooling like Smartsheet's enabling that to happen, right? How do you get people really engaged using new kinds of tooling to do higher order things? How do you connect that with work that's being done elsewhere? So it's a much more bottom up movement how I think about workforce transformation than digital transformation has been. And I think more, more people are cottoning on to the fact that that's the way you need to think about it. What's your number one ad advice for an executive who doesn't have time to read the 47 pages? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess it goes back to, to, to maybe the, um, those three A's I was talking about earlier. I think, you know, certainly progressive companies, but I think it's mainstreaming that companies are realizing they need to be more agile. Um, you know, in a broad brush, and it obviously depends on the context of that company, who their customers are and what they're trying to achieve. Um, but really, I, I think it should be a consideration, especially when thinking about workforce tooling, like knowledge worker tooling, to what degree is that giving more autonomy to those people to do higher order things? Uh, and, but also, you know, again, can you tie that back to your goals as a company? Right, because we've had certain technologies in the past sort of decade that have created a bit of a wild west, right? People go off and do different things and then there's, there's a lack of visibility, a lack of line of sight back to strategy. But if you get the sweet spot in, in your technology choices between do, that, do they help us be operationally agile? Are they giving people a higher order, you know, more ways to do higher order work? Can we tie that back in the way that we need to? Then I think you're at least thinking about it in the right way. It is really analogous to shadow IT. As, as you're sitting here talking about kind of the groundswell up of people finding tools to enable them to do their job better and get around kind mm. of the, the hierarchy that existed and got in their way before, it's sound, you know, there's a lot of parallels. Uh, yeah, to is. what happened there before finally the corporates figured out, okay, we actually need to do yeah. you know, dev in public cloud, there's a lot of advantages, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there is, but it's kind of like a legitimate version of shadow IT. Shadow IT was like, we, can't, we don't like the tools we've been given or we don't have them, let's go right. and find ones we actually like right, using. Right. Now it's like, the ones that are enterprise grade happen to be the ones we also like using, right? So that, that is the super interesting, um, sort of wave that companies like Smartsheet are carrying. These right. tools fundamentally appeal and they have lots of evidence that they're appealing virally. Well, um, I mean, the fact that, that you can collaborate with people outside your company on your license for free, and I think Mark said 50% of their users are people that are outside of the organization of the licensee, that's a pretty, yeah. pretty uh, I don't want to say Trojan uh, yeah. strategy, but yeah. certainly certainly feels like you know, a great way, way to permeate. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Which sure. I think back of like Atlassian with the way they got started with you know, a $10, 10 seat license, and, and again, AWS and some of these early yeah. kind of backdoor ways in to yeah. deliver real value that people were willing to put the credit card down yeah, for. Yeah. Right. Uh, but you know, I mean, so I, I guess a challenge for, for Smartsheet and others are, as you become a more enterprise grade platform, how do you keep that user appeal? Right. Because there could obviously be one scenario which says more features, more complication, actually more difficult to use, more complex. These guys are very conscious of it. Others in their sort of environment are very conscious of it. Um, but yeah, I mean the whole can-do thing which um, Anna talked about this morning in the keynote, it's, it's interesting, it's like a really interesting sort of democratized way of talking about power users that we kind of used to talk about. The sort of folks that have that technical ability and they're the ones that drive some kind of work initiative. Um, you know, platforms like Smartsheet and others are giving more people the ability to be that power user and that's, that's kind of cool. Great. Awesome. A great note to end on. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Chris. Pleasure, thanks for having me. I'm Rebecca Knight for Jeff Frick. Stay tuned, you're watching theCUBE.